my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Kindred Bravely. From adorable maternity wear to comfortable nursing bras, this mom-owned company has you covered. See all of their comfy clothing at kindredbravely.com. I especially love their Simply Sublime nursing tank. I talk about it all the time. And all of their high-waisted leggings are amazing for pregnancy and postpartum this time of year. At the end of this episode, Lauren and I will be chatting about all of both of our favorites from Kindred Bravely. And you can use the coupon code BIRTHHOUR for 20% off your purchase at kindredbravely.com. I wanted to take a minute to talk about a little update with our Patreon account. If you're not familiar, Patreon is a platform where you can pledge support for the creators that you love, and ours is at patreon.com slash birth hour. We recently added a $1 tier with access to our archived birth stories. So this is over 400 birth stories that get sent to the archives and are no longer available in your public feed, but for just $1 a month, you'll get access to all of those right when you sign up. We created this $1 tier to provide access to these birth stories for those with limited resources. If you want access to some of our other perks, we have two other tiers, a $5 and a $10. And if you head over to patreon.com slash birth hour, you'll see all of the perks that come with those as well. Again, that's patreon.com slash birth hour. Today's guest is Hillary, and she's going to be sharing her unplanned, planned surgical birth for a breech baby, as well as her experience having a really challenging time postpartum with difficulties around nursing, as well as dealing with postpartum gallstones. All right, let's hear from Hillary. Hi, Hillary. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here. I'm a huge fan of the show. Thank you. Will you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah. um, I live in Los Angeles with my husband and my baby. I have been married to my husband, Mike, for three years, and we've been together for nine years. And um, we had our baby this summer during the pandemic. All right. So let's start with um, finding out you were pregnant and how your pregnancy went. Yeah. So actually, before we started trying to conceive, I had to get my autoimmune disorder in check. So that took about a year and a half to get a diagnosis and get on the right treatment plan. Once that was sort of under control, um, our first step was actually seeing maternal fetal medicine before we were pregnant to come up with like how to manage the medication during pregnancy and for nursing. And so basically like we came up with a plan, I was going to go off the meds when I got my positive pregnancy test and then sort of manage any flares with Tylenol and and, uh, prednisone if the Tylenol didn't work. Um, basically like the only issue the autoimmune would have for pregnancy is that it causes fevers and especially in the first trimesters, high fevers are dangerous. So that was sort of what we were keeping an eye out for. Um, and then I also knew from that point that, after having a baby that I would only be able to nurse for about three months. That's how long my rheumatologist was comfortable with keeping me off medication. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of what I knew going in. Um, I've always had a really irregular period. So I was doing a lot of peeing on ovulation sticks. Um, I never seemed to register, um, peak fertility. Um, but after the third try, um, you know, I, I had taken a pregnancy test that was negative and then, um, there was a weekend I was at my brother's house. We were eating, um, like we had gotten takeout from a restaurant and I got home and I just felt so nauseous. And I was like, I'm never going to eat from there again. And I called in sick from work the next day. And then I was like, you know, I'll just take a pregnancy test on the off chance. And it came back positive. Um, so that's how I found out I was pregnant. It turns out it was not a tuna sandwich. It was a baby. Um, yeah. So, (laughs) um, my first trimester was basically, yeah, a pretty standard, I would say first trimester symptoms. I was nauseous. I was vomiting, um, nothing like, you know, hyperemesis or anything like that. Um, but I was basically nauseous 24 seven and that ended up kind of staying with me for the whole pregnancy, even through the third trimester. Um, you know, we got 
at 12 weeks, we got the results of um, a genetic screening. Um, and that's when we learned the gender too. And we were so happy that it was a girl. Um, and in the first trimester, I had one autoimmune flare, but I was able to manage it with Tylenol just fine. And then heading into the second trimester, I would say like the only thing that happened as far as pregnancy symptoms goes that I didn't really know to expect that I was feeling faint a lot. Um, like if I walked around for more than five minutes, I'd get sort of dizzy and need to sit down. Um, and one thing that really helped me actually with that was I would drink um, a lot of water before taking a shower. Um, that seemed to really help because this was happening in the mornings a lot. Yeah. And then um, we did our 20-week anatomy scan in February. And we learned there that the baby had um, a single umbilical artery in the cord. Um, and so basically at the time, the maternal fetal medicine doctor explained that like really the only thing we had to keep an eye out for with that is the baby's size. So it would mean getting more growth scans to keep an eye on size. But we were having additional growth scans anyway because that was part of how we were managing my autoimmune disorders interaction with pregnancy. Um, we also, at the anatomy scan, um, our baby was being very stubborn. So she wasn't turning the way they needed to look at her heart. Um, so we had to schedule a follow-up, um, to do a specific like echocardiogram. And that was a really nerve wracking time, the time in between, um, the anatomy scan and that heart follow-up. And it was like, I think we had a three or four day wait and, you know, I, I shouldn't have looked at Google, but I did. And that was just really nerve wracking. But when we did the heart scan, you know, our baby faced the camera, did what she needed to do. Um, and she was fine. So yeah, then the pandemic started in March. Um, so I was still in my second trimester. Um, and you know, that was really tough. My husband, um, he couldn't come to appointments anymore. Um, we were going to do an in-person birth class and that got, you know, canceled. So we ended up doing the know your options childbirth course. Um, and we actually really loved it. Yeah. As far as the pandemic stuff goes, we were just really, really cautious and conservative. I became really, anxious about the idea that maybe I would test positive and be separated from the baby. So I was really doing everything I could do to just stay safe and healthy. And at that time, we really had so little information that for me, I felt most comfortable being um, really cautious. But it, it was lonely. And um, I don't think how, obviously not what I expected when I got pregnant. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I would say um, the other thing that happened in the second trimester, and I only bring this up because it sort of foreshadowed things that happened postpartum, um, but I did my gestational diabetes test. I think, you know, I think I did it in the 20, week 24, maybe week 25. I did it whenever you normally do it. Um, and I went home after drinking that drink and I just had like the worst stomach pain. Um, it was really like in my upper abdomen and I was like in bed and I couldn't find a comfortable position. Like there was no way to be that I could manage. And I was crying and I called the OB, um, and they thought it was gas cause like your organ shift. And so I guess that could be gas pain up there, but, um, you know, it was so painful and, um, yeah, it was horrible. And as far as the test went, like I just barely didn't pass. So I had to do the longer test as well, but I did pass that. Um, but that stomach pain was really, uh, alarming. Um, we hired a doula. Um, our hope was that by the time, you know, it was time to give birth in June that maybe our doula could be there in person. Maybe the pandemic would be over. Um, and as far as a birth plan went, um, I really, I don't know. I thought of it more as birth preferences. Um, I tried not to be too, too rigid. My sort of preference was to have a happy, healthy, empowered birth, hopefully a vaginal birth. Um, I was open to doing an epidural. I was open to believing that I could do an unmedicated labor too. Um, I, um, do cognitive behavioral therapy and I've been in therapy a long time. And I talked a lot in therapy about like believing in my ability to birth and, um, working on trusting the health of my pregnancy, the health of my birth. And that was all really helpful. Um, so yeah, I entered the third trimester. Um, you know, as far as the pandemic's impact on that, there was talk about reducing the number of checkups I would do, like the number of those growth scans. But that just made me really anxious because I felt like between the umbilical cord and the autoimmune that I had, I was taking a lot of comfort in regularly 
seeing the baby on those screens. Um, so we ended up actually keeping those. And then as far as third trimester symptoms goes, um, my worst symptom was actually really intense hip pain. Um, like I would wake up at night with my pregnancy pillow and like whatever side I was lying on, that hip would be in so much pain. I'd have to roll to the other side and then I'd like sleep for an hour, wake up in pain and then roll over again. Um, and then as, um, the trimester went on, I started getting like these really strong, tight feelings kind of on my upper right side. Um, and I was like, this is either a head or a butt. <laughs> um, and I didn't think too much about it. And I, I wondered if it was maybe Braxton Hicks. Cause I, you know, it was my first pregnancy. I have no idea what that feels like. Um, but it just kind of felt like what I was reading in like, you know, the apps about like what baby's up to that week and the movements, it just didn't felt like it matched. Like I wasn't getting the sensation of being kicked in the ribs or anything like that. Um, and like most of the movement I felt was like very low and kind of felt like it was deep inside of me, if that makes sense, like low and behind kind of. Um, but I was doing kick counts, um, that helped with my anxiety and I was always on track with that. So at my 34-week scan, um, that was with maternal fetal medicine, um, but it wasn't my typical doctor. I, I guess she was on vacation. Um, so this other doctor did the scan, and then um, basically she said like that the baby looked great, but that the baby was breech. Um, and then very matter-of-factly, she was like, you can go to a chiropractor, you can do spinning babies, moxibustion, uh, aversion, and then you get a C-section. And she was just super matter-of-fact, and I was just like totally blindsided by it. Um, I just hadn't learned or heard that much about breech birth. And I, when I got home, I called my OB, um, and I asked some questions just about, um, like some of the gentle C-section practices that I had learned about actually from the know your options class. Um, and I was really, really sad when she said that, um, she doesn't do immediate skin to skin. I was like, well, what if we put a blanket over the baby? But she said the baby would have to come out and go on into the warmer. Um, so I was really sad and I had to kind of process that. Um, and part of the way I process everything is doing tons of research. So I just went, full tilt researching breech birth. Um, I started doing spinning babies exercises right away. I got a birth ball. I was on it all the time, lots of cat cow. And I tried doing some of the inverted spinning babies poses at home, but honestly, they made me kind of uncomfortable and nervous. And I think had I been able to have a person in my apartment with me watching, I might've felt better about it, but I had to trust my gut and it didn't feel, it just didn't feel right to me. But like I said, lots of birth ball, lots of cat cow. When I started doing more research, I was like looking through expecting better again. Like, what are the studies about breech birth? But there's really not much in there. Um, so I just started searching actually for like podcast episodes of women who had had um, breech babies. So there were a few on Birth Hour that I listened to um, and just other birth story podcasts. And that actually is what brought me to Dr. Berlin's podcast. He's a chiropractor and it turns out he's in LA and he's sort of like the chiropractor for breech babies. Um, so it was really hard for me to like weigh the pros and cons of seeing him with like COVID risk. But I felt like if I didn't try to do the chiropractic approach that I'd always wonder if that's, you know, what would have happened if I had. So I made my appointment and I was supposed to go while I was in uh, my 34th week still. Um, but then I had a really bad autoimmune flare. Um, I needed prednisone and I had had a high fever. So the COVID policy at the chiropractor's office didn't allow anyone who had had a fever within a certain time frame to go, which is totally fair. And like, we knew it was from the autoimmune, but the policy was the policy and I totally understood it. Um, so I pushed back the appointment a little while, um, for a few days and then I did the appointment, but I had decided against staying for moxibustion, um, just to mitigate the risk. You know, I felt like doing a shorter appointment with one person was safer than doing a longer appointment with two people. My experience with Dr. Berlin was fantastic. The pandemic had started. I had never had a prenatal massage. You know, I didn't do any of that stuff. So it was a really good experience to like have healing touch be part of my pregnancy experience after all. And it actually really helped my hips too, um, that hip pain I was having. I had researched um, 
you know, there's a care provider at my hospital who's one of the only doctors in this area who does vaginal breach delivery. Um, but I really, I was really stressed out and I just felt like even like the stress of seeing a new doctor so far into the pregnancy. And like, I felt like it was a COVID risk to like introduce more people into my life. I just wasn't sure that I would be able to like be calm about a vaginal breech birth because I'm the kind of person who always thinks about the risks and what could go wrong. And so I ended up deciding not um, to meet with the doctor who does vaginal breech delivery. So I had sort of been like, either this baby's going to flip or um, we'll move towards um, a planned surgical birth. Um, And that's a term I learned from my doula. Um, And it's been hugely beneficial for me. Um, And that term really helped me start reframing the possibility that that was the birth I was going to have and sort of working toward um, having a more positive experience with that. And then I had my next check with the OB, um, I guess at 36 weeks or so. Um, the baby hadn't flipped yet. So we went ahead with scheduling the ECV, um, external cephalic version for 37 weeks. Um, and one thing I'll just like note, I sort of started hearing from a lot of people that their babies had flipped after 36 weeks. Um, and I actually didn't find those stories very helpful, um, or very hopeful. I sort of knew that statistically the likelihood was pretty low. And I also, once I learned that that tight feeling was her head pressing up against me, I felt very certain that she had never been head down. It's not like she was flipping around in there. She was head up, very comfortable. And I, I wanted to spend my mental energy um, sort of starting to think about how it, things might go if she decided not to flip versus like, I don't know. I don't think I'm articulating this well, but I just found that people telling me their stories of how their baby flipped when I felt really confident, like that she wasn't going to spontaneously flip. It just didn't make me feel hopeful. It just stressed me out. Yeah. That makes sense to me too. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think people are trying to be helpful and stuff. It's just like, you know, no one knows your baby better than you. And once I learned what the feelings I was having, like, oh, the reason movement felt low was because it was like her little feet were down there, you know? Mm -hmm. So (laughs) it just felt to me like either she was going to flip in the ECV or she wasn't, you know? Um, so to prepare for the ECV, um, as I don't know, like I'm very big on preparation. So I actually watched a lot of YouTube videos, um, and I found that really helpful. And I would recommend that to anybody, um, who's moving forward with having that procedure and like going into the procedure, I had some pros and cons, like on the pro side was that my baby was sort of average to small size and I had really good fluid levels. So that meant that she had room to flip. Um, the sort of cons that I had was that I'm a first time mom and apparently first time moms have a lower success rate. But in general, from my research, I was seeing that the success rate really tends to break down to about 50, 50. So it's kind of a coin flip through my research. I had also realized that I wanted to have an epidural during the procedure because, um, some of the research I read suggested that there was increased success. Um, and it turns out that my OB did, um, epidurals as part of ECVs as just a matter of protocol. Like that's how she always did it. And I had also heard or read that, um, the muscle relaxant they give you can make your heart race. So I kind of went in knowing I might feel some weird symptoms. And like, I even knew actually from birth hour that some people, shiver or shake, uh, from epidurals. So I kind of knew I might feel odd from the meds. So the procedure was right on the day I turned 37 weeks, which was a Friday. We packed our suitcases and my husband was allowed in because with ECVs, there is a small risk that the procedure might trigger something that causes labor or, um, in the case of breech baby, like might trigger an emergency cesarean. And I found even with all my research that the procedure was just unexpectedly intense. Getting the IV was really painful. They tried both arms. They had trouble placing it. And the experience of getting the epidural was also really intense. Um, A resident did it and he was placing it. So, you know, he was behind me and like being talked through it by an attending. Um, And that really freaked me out. And then like, they stayed in the room and like the attending was like quizzing the resident about like dosages and and stuff, I guess that he has to learn about anesthesia throughout the procedure. And that was just really weird. 
And then basically like the doctors put their hands on you. They put like mineral oil on your belly. And then um, one doctor stands on each side. It was my OB and a resident. And then they like push and they try to rotate the baby that way. And basically like the amount of pressure they used just again, even with an epidural, it really surprised me how intense it was. And I was doing like really deep breathing, like some of the stuff I had been practicing with my doula, like it just really took me by surprise that it was not, um, it was, it was painful what was happening was they could get her to rotate in both directions, but they just couldn't get her head like past the midpoint of my belly on either side. And I think they tried for about 15 minutes. And when they were done, um, my OB was just, you know, she was like really kind. And she explained that like, I had done a great job. I had been completely like relaxed and breathing well and that nothing I had done, um, was the reason the baby wouldn't turn. But, you know, I was feeling really poorly at the time when I was hearing that, like, you know, as I had been told to expect the medicine, the muscle relaxant really skyrocketed my heartbeat, but then the epidural dropped it so low that I needed epinephrine to be picked back up. Um, so I was like hot and sweaty and shaky and I just felt really off. And I think I kept saying out loud, I feel weird. Like I couldn't even like articulate what was going on. I just didn't feel well. And I was sort of coming down from those feelings as I was also processing that the procedure didn't work. The next day, my stomach was still sore actually. So that was another thing I didn't know to expect that I would say for someone getting this procedure, there's a chance you'll feel soreness the next day. Um, But um, even though it didn't work, I'm really glad I did it. Sort of like going to the chiropractor, I just know I would have been wondering what if, if we hadn't. Um, and I had a follow up with my OB shortly after. Um, and I had some more questions like at that point where it it seemed like unless the baby flips, I was going to have a, a planned surgical birth, but I was hoping I asked like, would I be allowed to wait until going into labor and then have the surgical birth once labor starts that way, like the baby could pick her birthday and, and she could stay in as long as she felt she wanted to. Um, but the doctor said with breach that the risk is going into labor and cord prolapse where the cord comes out before the baby. She said that wasn't safe. And I think then knowing that the baby was staying in that footling position, um, made me sort of understand why it wasn't safe better. Um, and it also just gave me some emotional relief actually, because, like footling breach isn't recommended for vaginal birth. Like usually for vaginal breach birth, it's for like the Frank breach position where the baby is like in a V um, because their butt kind of serves the purpose of a head where it can expand, you know, through the birth canal. Um, But with feet, there's a higher risk of cord prolapse because um, like there's not a a head or a butt blocking the cord on their way out, if that makes sense. Um, So... Yeah. My next step was to plan for the surgical birth at 39 weeks. Um, I had started making a document, you know, just like a Google doc with my preferences and questions, um, that I had started working on with my doula. Um, and I was going to go over it, um, with my OB at the 38 week, um, appointment. And I remember, um, so again, the ECV was on Friday and I remember, like going to bed on Tuesday thinking like, oh, I still haven't heard from them to schedule, um, the surgery. I'll have to do that tomorrow. Like, why aren't they calling me? Um, which brings me into my birth story. (laughs) All right. So I go to bed on Tuesday and my water broke in the middle of the night, like around 1245 AM. I knew like instantly that that's what it was. Like I woke up, my sheets were all wet. Um, and then when I got out of bed, like more water gushed out. So there was just no question what was happening. Um, but I wasn't experiencing contractions. Um, so I wasn't worried about, you know, the cord or anything like that. Um, so I called the OB, um, and we actually had never brought our suitcases in from the car after the ECV. So our bags were packed and in the car, my husband and I, like we called our moms from the car on the drive to the hospital and we called the doula. Um, and it was all pretty exciting. Like it, you know, it was, yeah, I don't know. We were just really excited. And like I said, since I wasn't experiencing contractions, I wasn't scared or nervous in that way. Um, I was more like nervous and excited about like, oh my gosh, I can't believe today's the day. Um, 
And so we got to the hospital about 1.30 in the morning and like I was still leaking water. Like I remember when we got out of the car, like we parked the car in the parking lot. I like opened the door. I get out and just like more water like gushed down into my sweatpants. And I was just like, this is so gross. So <laughs> like my pants are all wet. My sneakers are soaked. Um, and so they let me in first. I don't know why they made my husband wait before he was allowed in the room with me, but they started prepping me for surgery. Um, they like had asked about when the last time I ate was they cleansed my like abdominal region with, I think with wipes or something. Um, like I didn't have to get in a shower. Um, and they shaved my pubic hair, which I did not know to expect. So that's something I wish I had known in advance. Um, my OB got there. Um, I think she got to the hospital around two 30 or three. And I basically just like pulled up my Google doc on my phone and asked as many of those questions and preferences as I could before, um, things got started. And, um, basically, you know, I asked about whether it was possible to have a clear drape for the moment of birth. And it was, um, I asked if I could play music and I could, um, I asked to do delayed cord clamping and have my husband cut the cord and both of those were okay. And then I also asked about like, what would I hear during the procedure? I didn't want there to be like the kind of talking that there was during the ECV. But I also like didn't know if I would hear like scary surgical instruments or anything like that. And basically the OB just said you that the talking would be minimal. It would be like asking for instruments to be passed or, you know, comments about the actual surgery itself, but like it wouldn't be like chatty. And then my last question um, was I asked if I could request an attending to do my spinal instead of a resident. Um, and they said yes. And that is something I would highly recommend to anybody else who's going through this. Um, when it was time to, um, yeah, like when it was time to actually get my spinal, I knew I wouldn't have to like listen to it be narrated, uh, which was helpful. Um, the, it was funny though, cause the anesthesiology resident, like who came in to ask like the kind of screening questions or like the questions they ask before they get started, like was clearly slightly disappointed that he wouldn't get to do the spinal. And I felt guilty because he seemed nice, but like, uh, uh, you know? Yeah, I can relate to that. I feel like if there's anything that makes you nervous, particularly to just, yeah, speak up and get the most experienced person. Like I had a, a rough experience with my first birth tearing a lot and it made me very hesitant about cervical checks with subsequent mm. births and so like my midwife I would just be like I want you to do all of them I don't want your apprentices like learning what <laughs> is going on when I'm already super nervous about it so yeah I feel you on that totally so yeah I was I was brought into the OR um and I actually gave one of the nurses um my point and shoot digital camera and I asked her if she could uh try to take some photos during the birth and she did um and then after I got into the OR, that's when I got the spinal. And, um, I felt like I was falling forward. Like they have you sit on the table with your knees hanging off. And I felt like I was falling forward. And I asked, I was like, can I just scoot back? And they were like, oh my God, no. <laughs> they were like, we like have a needle, like a place in your back. You can't move. So nurses, um, it was it, nurses like came to the front of me and they actually pushed on my knees. So I didn't feel like I was falling forward, which was really helpful. And I kind of suspect that I wasn't falling and that I was just experiencing numbness, you know, starting, but um, I'm really glad I asked <laughs> instead of just scooting. And then my husband was then allowed in and he stayed up by my head. I was at the time feeling like nervous and excited. And that, um, resident anesthesiologist was up by my head too. And he was like completely geeking out, like kind of scurrying and like looking behind the curtain and just looking very excited to be there. And then I had like a, like, like, I'm sorry, you didn't get to do the spinal, but like I made the right choice, you know? Um, and then basically, um, you know, it, it, it was pretty quick. Um, and, um, I felt some, like, I guess I felt like some pulling, um, and tugging, but the sensations were not very strong and it wasn't painful. Nothing, you know, nothing like the ECV or anything like that. And when it was time, the OB sort of let me know and they lowered the blue drape so that I, there was a clear drape. And it felt like in an instant, she was like on top of my chest. Um, and, um, the OB was like, you can touch her. So I did. And I, I touched her through the drape and she had so much hair and, and I could tell just that she was, you know, warm on my chest and, um, she started crying and, um, they brought her 
over to the warmer and my husband went with her. And I just remember I kept asking like, is she okay? Is she okay? And everybody was saying yes. And, you know, my husband was telling me how beautiful and amazing she was. And, you know, going into, um, the surgical birth, I, I was really worried that I would have this feeling of like, where's my baby? Um, but actually like knowing that she was with my husband the whole time, it made me feel great. And I felt like that she was being watched over, Um, and he was just saying how beautiful she was. And I remember hearing my OB say at one point, like, you know, move quickly, like she wants to do skin to skin. Um, and so they brought her back to me, um, and she was all swaddled with a little hat with a bow on it. Um, and she was like, so cute. And I remember saying like, she has eyebrows. Like I didn't know babies came out with eyebrows. (laughs) Um, and so at that point I was still lying flat Um, and she was on me and I was holding her, but I was, I had started shaking very, very badly. Um, which, you know, I knew to expect from the ECB and from other people's, um, birth stories, but, um, I really didn't feel safe holding her for too long because of the shaking. Um, so my husband took her again and I kind of looked at her while my husband held her. Um, and then within an hour we were in the recovery room and we did skin to skin there and we did our first nursing session. Um, I was still shaky in the post-op room, but like in post-op, they were able to put you, um, in one of the beds that props up. So that made me feel much safer, um, with holding her. Um, and you know, um, our baby Claire, she was totally healthy. Um, they all remarked on how proportional she was. Like she was small. She was just under six pounds, but my OB said that usually small babies tend to be long and slim, but like she was chubby. Um, and I remember the OB was really surprised by the weight, um, that she, like that she was that small. Um, and she had jaundice the next day. So we, she did a day and a night of phototherapy. Um, and apparently that's very common with babies, uh, born via surgical birth, um, as is a lot of spit up, which is good to know. Cause I like panicked once while she was spitting up in the hospital and like, I was still numb and I couldn't go get up and get to the bassinet. And it turns out that spitting up a lot is totally normal. Um, as far as like, why she was breached. The OB said that, um, when they took her out, the cord was wrapped around her neck, but the cord itself was long enough that she did have room to flip. Um, and so basically, um, we never really found out why she chose not to. Um, and my OB said, you often don't know. And really, um, after the ECV, I had sort of made my peace with like, she has her reasons, like she's comfy head up and like, this is what she wants. Um, but you know, I, I sort of was hoping that there would be an answer, um, but there wasn't. Um, and actually, um, when we like looked at the photos, the nurses took, um, the nurse managed to get a photo of the moment of Claire being born. And like, she was born even in the surgery feet first. Um, so that's just the way she wanted to do it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so sweet. I feel like the yeah. way breech babies come out, you can really like visualize how they were in the womb too. Totally. And I have to say, you know, my birth experience was really positive. I just felt, you know, and I thanked her when she came out for choosing her birthday. Um, but I felt, I'm, I'm a little choked up. I felt so grateful to her that I got to experience labor. I just felt so grateful um, that I got that experience. And then the actual, you know, atmosphere in the room was just really happy. And my husband and I were so excited to meet her and that she was healthy, you know, it was just so special. (laughs) Yeah. So after that birth experience, how was your postpartum just recovery, both physically and emotionally? Yeah. Um, as far as the physical recovery went, I had uh, done a lot of research and I knew that for me, I wanted to really stick with the schedule of pain meds. And that really helped me. Um, my pain was really well managed, I would say through the recovery. And actually the only setback I had, you know, I had read like, Oh, if you, um, feel better after the surgery, like don't stop taking your meds. Cause then you'll feel bad. And like, you'll trick yourself into thinking you're better. And I was like, well, I'm not going to do that. I'll stay on the meds. Um, but I sort of felt so good that I started doing more physically than I should have. And that caused a setback pain wise. Um, but that corrected pretty quickly once I sort of cooled it with how much, um, physical activity I was doing. Um, 
but yeah, the, I would say like, as far as like taking the meds go, um, I was really nauseous during my first few weeks postpartum. And I only sort of, it took me a few weeks to realize looking back that I think it was a side effect of the medication. Um, at least for me, I was prescribed prescription strength Motrin and that can make people nauseous. Um, so that made like eating enough for nursing really hard. And I just felt not great, but yeah, I would say that's sort of my, yeah, my surgical recovery was good. My scar was good. Um, we had sort of a rough go of it with nursing. Um, our immediate nursing session after birth went well, she latched and I was able um, to give her some colostrum. Um, but every subsequent nursing session really got worse. Um, I had a terrible night nurse on our first night postpartum and like, you know, it, it was, it was a really bad experience. And, um, the evening ended with her setting me up on a breast pump without explaining it. And I had no idea that like the pump was going on to higher and higher levels. Like I had just thought that like, Oh, if you pump for five, more than five minutes, it's excruciating. Um, and, uh, I would say I did get a pro tip from my doula the next morning, but you can actually request to change nurses. Um, I only learned that after this woman's shift was over. Um, but you know, the charge nurse like assured us I wouldn't see her again. Um, but yeah, so even after that pumping session, I, I was still able to like hand express colostrum, but not much was really coming out via pumping or while I was nursing and the hospital did have lactation consultants. Um, and then on her second day in the hospital, when she was doing the phototherapy she needed, um, that was all day and overnight. And she was basically taking breaks every three hours to come back to our room to do skin to skin and nurse. Um, but the doctors had put her on formula um, during the phototherapy, cause that can help get rid of the jaundice. And we all agreed and felt good about that decision. Um, but yeah, like our last day in the hospital, we just had another really rough nursing session. And I just, when I got home, I was just like really anxious about nursing and really emotionally exhausted by it. Um, I was just really afraid of the pain that it was and all the crying. Um, so I started a really strict pumping regimen, uh, I was pumping every three hours, 10 to 20 minutes. We were feeding her formula and giving her maybe, like I was able to get maybe an ounce of breast milk a day. Um, and sometimes I would skip a day of giving her so that I could build up enough to get her a full ounce. Um, and like my supply wasn't really increasing as the days went by. So I tried like one hour power pumping sessions where you do, I forget the exact, I would, I forget the exact, um, protocol for that, but it was like 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off, 20 minutes on, 10 minutes off, stuff like that. Um, and those sessions like increased my immediate output by a little, but it didn't really jumpstart anything. And I just was really never able to express more than like 10 milliliters per session, you know? Um, and the, it, they would just leave me feeling like really sad and really disappointed. Um, especially when I was waking up in the middle of the night to pump and we were all so tired, of course, cause we were, you know, we had a newborn. Um, and so I had started trying to nurse her again and it was less painful than it was in the hospital, but she was still like obviously really unhappy at the breast and presumably because she just wasn't getting, um, very much milk. I had an IBCLC, um, lactation consultant come to our apartment. Um, and that was so helpful. Um, I really wanted to give nursing like a chance to be this like fulfilling and peaceful experience, um, you know, that I hoped it could be for the months I was allowed to do it. Um, but basically, um, the consultant's take was that like, given that like I could only nurse for a certain amount of time because I had to go back on my meds. Um, so it was a fairly short timeline in her opinion. Um, she felt like, like that I shouldn't work like crazy to increase my supply. Cause I was going to have to start the weaning process in about eight weeks anyway. So she was like, okay, so don't go crazy trying to build up your supply. And like, I really want you to stop pumping because it's miserable for you. You know, like this, this really sucks. So that those were kind of like her two guiding principles. And then basically she said, you know, given the low supply, like nursing really might not be more than what it already had been, you know, short sessions. And really only if um, the baby continued to tolerate being at the breast with really low flow. And we tried um, like the syringe technique. Um, and I just found it for me, I just found it 
alienating in a way that I hadn't been finding bottle feeding. Um, like it just felt like too much to introduce devices to nurse for like five minutes. Um, and it just kind of bummed me out more than not doing it at all. And our consultant told me, she was like, you know, breastfeeding might not be the best option for you. And that really gave me like the peace of mind that I really needed to make the choice to stop pumping. Um, like she was an expert and she had experience getting like even non birthing parents nursing. And she felt like this might not be right for us, you know, and, and that really eased my mind. Um, and like weaning only took 24 hours, you know, like I like, I don't think I even had to pump again, you know, like I think I had been told like pump when you feel pain, like I never felt any and I leaked a little and then it stopped. Um, and at our follow-up, which we did virtual, um, she had come to our apartment. Like I, you know, I felt like it was worth the risk at the time and, but our follow-up we did virtual and she basically just told me over and over again that like I had done a lot to get milk to my baby and that it wasn't about giving up, but it was really about making the best decision you know, for my mental health, but also for my baby's stress level, which I hadn't even, you know, thought of it from that perspective. And that was really helpful. Um, I would say the other thing we did postpartum that was really helpful was we actually, um, did a postpartum visit with our doula. Um, and we had done all of our (laughs) meetings with her virtual, um, because of COVID. Um, but she did come to our apartment and she stayed, you know, she wore a mask, but having her in person was just amazing. Um, and so I think if that's a risk that people are comfortable to take during the pandemic, I think it's worth it just to have that extra support. Um, those early days are really hard. So we also like activated our family pod. So, uh, my mom was able to come over and my brother and sister-in-law. Um, and then, um, yeah, after, um, we weaned Claire, her diet for a month and a half was actually, um, like half formula and half donor milk from my sister-in-law, which was so amazing. Um, she had built a really big stash, um, with my nephew. And so she just really generously just gave it all to us. And that's what Claire ate. And, um, you know, I was so, I still am so grateful for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the only other like immediate postpartum, um, thing, and it's really about the baby, but because Claire was born breech, we had to do a hip ultrasound at four weeks, which I didn't really know about until her pediatrician checkup, but that's kind of a good FYI. Um, babies who are born breech are at a higher risk of hip dysplasia. So we had to go to the children's hospital and she got her hips ultrasounded. Um, but she did uh, pass her ultrasound, which was great. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I can move on to the next chapter of my postpartum. Yeah. I know you had some not so immediate postpartum things to share. Yeah. So about six weeks postpartum, I got really sick. I had like this terrible upper abdominal pain that was very similar. You know, it felt just like I felt after the gestational diabetes test and I was throwing up. Um, and so I did like a telehealth appointment with a doctor who was like, it's a stomach virus or it's food poisoning. Um, and it passed in a couple of days and, and, you know, those days were rough to have a newborn and to be so sick. Um, but it passed and life went on. And then about two weeks later it happened again. Um, and this time I just couldn't stop throwing up. Um, and I was in extremely intense pain it was just obvious that I had to go to the ER and going to the ER gave me a lot of anxiety because of COVID, but there was no way around it. Um, so I was, uh, pretty quickly admitted because I was experiencing pancreatitis caused by gallstones. Um, and, uh, I would need my gallbladder removed, um, you know, with a gallbladder removal surgery, it's laparoscopic, but, um, I had to wait in the hospital until the pancreatitis passed. So I was alone in the hospital Um, you know, unlike when you're there for birth, you're not allowed to, with COVID, you, I wasn't allowed to have anybody with me or visit me. Um, so I was alone in the hospital. I was NPO, um, which means like you're not allowed to eat or drink water for several days. Um, and I just remember thinking while I was there that it was such a blessing in disguise that I had weaned because I was in the hospital for five days and four nights and you know, even with a pump, I don't think my, I don't, I think, I don't think my supply would have really lasted through that hospitalization. Um, and so, yeah, my last full day in the hospital, I had the surgery. 
I went home the next day. Um, and that recovery was quick. Um, you know, as everybody said it would be, but it was still a recovery from surgery. You know, there was pain and pain meds again. Um, but you know, I was recovering. Um, you know, I was eating low fat for a while, but I was able to sort of get back to my regular diet. Um, and, um, you know, I had learned that gallstones are actually fairly common, um, a, a fairly common, uh, side effect for pregnant women, gallstones and kidney stones. And it has to do with, um, like the hormonal changes of pregnancy. Um, another thing that can cause gallstones is uh, rapid weight loss. And I had realized that I lost postpartum weight really fast. Uh, I think within four weeks, I was like within striking distance of my pre-pregnancy weight because I think I had been so nauseous. I just wasn't eating a lot. And I, I was spending a lot of energy doing that pumping. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I recovered and kind of life went on. And then about Six weeks later, Claire was three months old. Um, I had an autoimmune flare and I had started taking prednisone and like, I woke up at night with terrible heartburn. And then the next day my stomach was really hurting. And I was like, this has to be a side effect. Like they told me like, I'm not going to get gallstones again because my gall, I don't have a gallbladder, can't make stones with no gallbladder. Um, and I like remember making a note in my journal, like to bring up in therapy, how much anxiety stomach aches like that were giving me like I need to learn how to cope with this and not be afraid. Um, but that night it just kept getting worse and I started vomiting uncontrollably again. And it just became obvious again that I had to go to the ER again. Um, and I was admitted and it was the same thing. I had pancreatitis. It turned out that I had retained stones after my gallbladder removal, which is a very, very rare complication. I, I think it's like less than 1% or less than 2%. Um, so the sort of same thing all over again, days of being NPO, no food, no water. I was going to get a procedure called an ERCP, um, where they like send a camera down there and kind of clear out any stones they see and potentially widen, um, your duct to make any other stones pass easier. Um, and then the m morning of the procedure, my, my face, um, like felt sore, like as if I had been really clenching my jaw and I brought it up that morning. Um, and you know, people were like, Oh, you must've slept on it weird or whatever. And then I go down to the operating room or like the pre-op area for the ERCP. Um, and I mentioned this soreness on the side of my face and, um, they decided, um, like it turns out that I was like really swollen on that side of my face and that the anesthesiologist wasn't comfortable moving forward with the procedure, which was like really devastating. Cause I was like, Oh my God, like it's already been, you know, I've been here like four days already. Like now I'm going to have to wait longer to get this procedure so I can just get home to my family. Um, but what happened was those days of not eating or drinking water, um, my salary very gland, um, had basically gotten backed up and then infected. Um, but sort of on the bright side, while I was waiting for my gland to get better, um, the stone passed on its own and all of my numbers returned back to normal. Um, so that in total was like another five days on the ho in the hospital. Um, and I left, I left the hospital on like a really crazy cocktail of antibiotics um, to help the infection in my salivary gland. And then one of my routine staff infection tests had come back positive. So they had to be really, really careful on um, the chance that I had staff, which I don't think I actually had, but you know, they have to assume I did. So once, once the antibiotics, once I was done with the antibiotics, things got a lot better. Um, I felt like I felt like myself again. And, um, yeah, I mean the work now that I, you know, I think will be an ongoing process is like trusting that I am home, you know, and that I'm okay. And, that it's that particular journey is done. Yeah, that makes sense. That's like a lot to process when you're already processing so much from your birth. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think the thing that's frustrating to me is, you know, I now realize that my first like gallstone attack was definitely the day of the gestational diabetes test. Mm -hmm. Like it was that same intense upper abdominal pain. And I feel like it was missed then. And it was missed at my six weeks postpartum, you know, when that telehealth doctor told me it was like a stomach virus. Right. Um, and I think the reason I have some 
anger about it is that given that like something like 10 to 12% of, um, pregnant women experience gallstones and not necessarily in a symptomatic way, but like that's fairly high percentage. So yeah. it seems to me like this should have been on doctors radars, mm-hmm. um, in a way that I feel like it wasn't. Um, and so I've kind of like every pregnant woman I know, and I like, even in the birth hour Facebook group, I'm like, know these symptoms. Like if this is happening to you, like speak up because I think had, had it been caught earlier, I think I, I might not have had to go through the pancreatitis, which is just so, so painful. Um, and you know, I, I think there's probably no way around. I like, I knew, like, I think my gallbladder would have had to come out, but that could have been a planned surgery and it could have been potentially outpatient, but because I had progressed to pancreatitis, you know, they had to get that under control and Mm -hmm. dealing with pancreatitis is really unpleasant. So I just don't want anybody to go through that, you know? Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that part of your story as well, even yeah, though for it sure. was, you know, a couple months postpartum. Yeah. Were there any resources that you haven't mentioned that you want to add here at the end? Yeah. Um, I guess I mentioned spinning babies. Um, that was really helpful. Evidence-based birth was really helpful for during my research. The birth hour patrons Facebook group was really helpful. I, um, yeah, I actually shared pieces of my birth story in there and I had asked people about their ECV experiences there. So it was really helpful, you know, to have a group of people to talk to, I think, especially during the pandemic. I was a big podcast listener. So birth hour, obviously, but, um, also the informed pregnancy podcast and, um, this podcast called birth Queens with a K it's like a doula and a midwife. Um, and, um, as far, you know, I read expecting better and crib sheet by Emily Oster. I love her newsletter too. Um, uh, as far and like I did the know your options childbirth course, that was great. Oh, that's so great. I'm so happy that the know your options course was helpful to you. All right. We'll put all of those on the show notes page. And then did you want to share where people can connect with you? Yeah. Everyone can connect with me on Instagram. I'm on there a lot sharing (laughs) photos of food and my baby. So yeah, my DMS on Instagram are open. Um, and it's just at Hillary Dixler Canavan. All right. Well, thank you so much, Hillary, for sharing. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to chat with Lauren about Kindred Bravely, today's sponsor. Hi, Lauren. Thanks for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Kindred Bravely. Absolutely. Happy to. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you before we start talking about Kindred Bravely? Sure. I am uh, married to my wife, Deanna. We've been married for about three years, and we have a 20-month-old daughter, Sawyer, whose birth story we recorded here. And then I'm due any day now with our second, his baby boy. So did you discover Kindred Bravely with your daughter or is it newer to you? Yeah, I think I actually first heard about Kindred Bravely from listening to your podcast. And I, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I found underwear really uncomfortable. I don't know if that's super common or not, but I had a really hard time trying to find underwear that felt uh, good. And so I started with their under the belly hipster uh, underwear. And mm-hmm. at the time they were using that really, really soft, like bamboo like material. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was the first thing that I purchased from them. And I swear it was like slipping into heaven. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Those underwear are insanely comfortable. And I feel like I was missing out with my first two pregnancies, just like making normal underwear work because you should totally treat <laughs> yeah. yourself. You know, it's like, I think $20 for a three pack or something for butter underwear. Well, <laughs> like you said. Right. It was, it was well worth it. And I remember after I was pregnant, I decided that I wasn't going to wear them when I was not pregnant so that when I was pregnant again, I would have them there ready. <laughs> so smart. So you don't wear them out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I started with those. I think they changed the material for the hipster underwear. So I bought another around this pregnancy and um, they didn't, the sizing didn't fit the same. And just kind of a side note, cause they, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I've seen them in their ads talk about is their customer service and they were great. Uh, I messaged them and I was like, I, I thought I was buying the same thing and I, I got them and they didn't fit right. And they just sent me a new size free of charge, which was way more than I expected. So that was great. Yeah. They're so great about making, making it right for sure. Mm-hmm. What else have you tried? Just the underwear or have you tried any of the bras or tanks? No, I actually, this time uh, being pregnant, I sort of like 
made up how to wear pajamas in my first pregnancy, which looking back seems kind of silly. I, I think I was that way about a lot of the maternity clothes. I thought, oh, no, it'll be fine. I'll just wear a bigger size T-shirts or something. But maternity stuff really does feel better. <laughs> so I got two pair of their shorts pajamas this time. And again, that material is just like it's just like butter. Putting it on is just fantastic. And yeah, it was nice so to have soft. something kind of new that was special for being pregnant. <laughs> so that was fun. Yeah, I definitely recommend for the moms out there who are going into the fall, winter baby time frame, the long, kind of like they're almost like legging pajamas with a nursing top that's long sleeves and you can wear them as like long johns or pajamas. And I like lived in those. Yeah, I think they're like all, they're almost the same style. It's just the ones that I bought were during the springtime. So they're shorts and short sleeve shirt. Yeah. And then I, I bought their um, nightgown too that I'm saving for after delivery in the hospital. Uh, but oh, it's the same nice. material. It's that same cozy. I just remember last time after having my daughter in the hospital, I was still wearing the hospital gown. And it was when visitors started coming, it was like impossible to keep the whole thing up while I was nursing. And so I decided this time I wanted to have something that was specifically made for me to nurse on one side and not be exposing myself to everybody that walked in the room. That's it made the idea. fathers and brothers uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like I will nurse in public and like I have no problems, but there's something about like my dad and brother that I'm like, <laughs> I, know. I think I'm going to just cover up. Um, I know. <laughs> okay, I just looked it up. It's the Jane Maternity and Nursing Thermal Pajamas. Those things are like the softest pajamas ever. Um, oh, cool. They're long sleeves and long pants, so you probably wouldn't want to wear them in the summer. But I also just talked to someone recently who wore the um, Kendra Bravely labor and delivery gown for like after the baby was born for kind of like that hospital stay when they still needed to check her fundus or her scar and for nursing and stuff. So that's a something to keep in mind too. You probably wouldn't want to wear it if you wore it during labor, but if you didn't. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't seen that one. I looked at... Um it might have been I clicked on an ad specifically for the nightgown, the nursing um, and pregnancy nightgown, I think is what it's called. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I'm glad that all those things were working out for you. Yeah, they're great. I, I also have a couple of their um, their bras, the, the Terry Racerback. Mm-hmm. Um, I bought that in two sizes. And I think the only, I mean, that that's really comfortable too, because it's not a really super structured bra. So sleeping in it feels comfortable. Yeah. That's what I use it for. Oh, okay. Perfect. I was going to say I'm not particularly large chested, but it feels like I grow so much when I'm, when I'm pregnant. Crazy. I'm not used to having it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that seems to be working well too. Awesome. Yeah. Those are really cozy. And I know some moms can wear them like all day long, but I pretty much just wear them for sleep. And then I need the the simply sublime ones for during the day. Mm. Yeah, I can wear mine during the day. At least for now, we'll see when Jealous. I'm nursing. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me about Kindred Bravely. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. Thank you so much again to Hillary for sharing her birth story with us and to Kindred Bravely for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget you can go to kindredbravely.com and use the coupon code BIRTHHOUR for 20% off your purchase. And if you want more information from today's episode, head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Hillary's name in the search bar and her show notes page will come right up for you. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.